Hello, and welcome to this presentation by the Foundation for the Education and Research in Neurological Emergencies. This educational lecture is titled Managing Emergency Department Headache Patients, Life-Threatening Headaches, and COVID-19 Implications. My name is Edward Sloan. I'm currently Medical Director of the Physician Assistant Studies Program at Dominican University, and I have been an attending physician in emergency medicine at Carl Foundation Hospital. I am Professor Emeritus in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The content for this lecture comes in large part from the monograph titled Evaluation and Management of Life-Threatening Headaches in the Emergency Department by Dr. Zoda et al. It was published in Emergency Medicine Practice by EB Medicine, February 2019. Please refer to the complete video and audio content for this educational lecture, as well as other individual parts of this lecture via links found at fern.org. You may also refer to the initial podcast and the CME option on the EB Medicine website at ebmedicine.net and specifically at the link listed below. Please note the disclaimer listed below. In general, this information is intended to augment and not replace the clinical judgment that guides the management of any individual patient. When considering secondary headaches that could be life threats, subarachnoid hemorrhage, of course, is the most important disease to be considered. Sudden, severe thunderclap headaches are what we're looking for. These are headaches with maximum severity in a matter of minutes from the time of headache onset, as if you were hit by a baseball bat, for example. Maximum severe intensity in minutes Significant morbidity and mortality can result with subarachnoid hemorrhage, so having an, a high-quality ED diagnostic strategy is important. This includes making sure you know what the timing of the sudden ictus was, knowing that there are often precursor episodes of headache that por, uh, portend the occurrence of this subarachnoid hemorrhage. We'll talk a little bit about the CT versus LP versus CTA strategy and the ASEP clinical policy. On this slide, you can see both the ring-shaped collection of blood that matches the distribution of the circle of Willis that's in the brain. Let's talk just a minute about likelihood ratios. If you have likelihood ratios between zero and one, this decreases the probability of a disease. So a negative likelihood ratio of 0.5 might decrease your likelihood of disease fo uh, following a a priori or pretest assessment by 15%. A likelihood ratio of 0.2 decreases the post-test assessment by 30% and a Likelihood ratio of 0.1 decreases it by 45%. This is a large decrease. So a positive likelihood ratio is just the opposite. A positive likelihood ratio of 2 only increases the likelihood of disease by 15%. A likelihood ratio of 5 by 30%. And a positive likelihood ratio of 10 increases your likelihood of disease by 45%. So let's give an example. Let's say you see a patient with headache, sudden severe, you think there's a pretest probability of subarachnoid of 10%. If a positive likelihood ratio of a symptom or sign is 6.6, .6, that means the post-test probability increases by 35%. And so your post-test probability will increase 40 to 45%. So the pretest odds of subarachnoid were 1 in 10, and the post-test odds of subarachnoid hemorrhage is now almost 1 in 2. So what findings suggest subarachnoid hemorrhage? The finding of meningismus has a positive likelihood ratio of 6.6, .6, and the complaint of neck stiffness a positive likelihood ratio of 4.1. Focal deficit has a positive likelihood ratio of 3.2, and others are listed on this slide. But if you look at the most important ones, meningismus, neck stiffness, focal deficit, photophobia, or loss of consciousness, 
This has a 15 to 35% increased risk from your pretest probability of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule has inclusion criteria for patients 15 years of age or older, normal Glasgow Coma Scale score, new onset severe headache, and maximum intensity within an hour. There are many exclusion criteria that are listed here. And these exclusion criteria are the ones that will be critical to our ability to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you look at the exclusion criteria and all of them are negative, it actually has 100% sensitivity, no false negatives for excluding subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you could develop these into a dot phrase where you say, the patient I have is age less than 40, has a negative history, no loss of consciousness. It is not an exertional onset headache. It is not a thunderclap headache, not sudden and severe. There's no neurodeficit, no papilledema, no neck pain, tenderness or stiffness, and no meningismus. If you can put this into your note, you can say, and quote, the risk of a subarachnoid hemorrhage approaches zero such that testing beyond non-contrast head CT is not clinically indicated. I've discussed it with the patient. The patient is aware and agrees with the plan. Now, the ASEP clinical policy from 2008 addressed testing for patients with headache. And at that time, they said if the CT is negative, is a lumbar puncture indicated? And it generated a level B recommendation that says the following, in patients presenting to the ED with sudden onset severe headache and a negative non-contrast head CT scan result, lumbar puncture should be performed to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. And note that this statement does not apply to any other ED headache patients, only those with sudden severe headache, which are nearly all of our patients. So, is, the C, is an LP indicated if the CT is negative? We know that most of the recent literature suggests that a CT-only approach without LP is appropriate when headache ictus is less than six hours prior to exam. The CT ability to detect subarachnoid hemorrhage continues to improve such that post-test probability of a subarachnoid after a negative non-contrast CT is significantly lower. It has a very clinically useful negative likelihood ratio and if that negative likelihood ratio approaches 0.1, that means there's nearly a 50% risk reduction for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, what about more testing if the CT and LP are negative? The 2008 policy generated a level B recommendation regarding subarachnoid hemorrhage diagnosis saying that patients with sudden severe, a sudden severe headache, sudden onset, who have a negative findings on a head CT, a normal opening pressure on LP, and negative findings in CSF do not need emergency angiography and can be discharged from the ED with follow-up recommended. And it notes that normal ICP can be assessed clinically just by knowing that the fluid on lumbar puncture is not coming out rapidly. Now, what about CT angiography? Well, we know that LP is not useful when the exam is performed, an LP, within six hours after the ictus. And we know that the CT is useful when the exam is performed in less than six hours after the ictus. So we know in that acute setting, less than six hours, LP most often is of less value to rule out subarachnoid. And the question is, can CTA be performed following a normal CT? What's the logic? If you do a CTA and there's no aneurysm, then there's not a subarachnoid hemorrhage from a leaking aneurysm. Why CTA? Because CTA is a good exam down to six branches from the main cerebral vessels. So for subarachnoid hemorrhage, CTA is clinically more useful and can be quickly performed from the ED than an MRA. Now, regarding subarachnoid hemorrhage treatment, blood pressure management, you want to achieve a systolic blood pressure of 160 millimeters of mercury or less. You want to use nimodipine, a calcium channel blocker, 60 milligrams PO, Q4 hours. 
There's only limited data on anti-epileptic drug therapy, but in general, it's probably not indicated unless the patient does have a seizure. And then there's ultimate aneurysm management, either by a clip or coil. So we addressed some questions. The most important one is what about LP and CTA, and what about the performance of CT in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, fortunately, the 2019 ASEP clinical policy, critical issues in the evaluation and management of adult patients presenting to the emergency department with acute headache was put together by Drs. Godwin, Cherkas, Panago, Shi, Birney, and Wolf. And so this policy addressed adults with headache and asked four questions, giving three levels of recommendation based on the strength of evidence, most are levels B and C, given that we only put together clinical policies when there's some uncertainty, but on occasion there are a few level A recommendations that have certainty and uniform acceptance by clinicians. So one question was asked in this clinical policy by ASEP, in the adult ED patient presenting with acute headache, are there risk stratification strategies that reliably identify the need for emergent neuroimaging? And in fact, this question generated a level B recommendation that says use of the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule as a decision rule that has high sensitivity to rule out subarachnoid, but low specificity to rule in subarachnoid for patients presenting to the ED with a normal neurological exam and peak headache severity within one hour of onset of pain symptoms. In other words, the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule is a good test to rule out because it's highly sensitive with few false negatives. We understand that there are many false positives and it has low specificity, but the ability to rule out is dependent upon a good test with high sensitivity. And the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule is such a test. It does note also in this level B recommendation that although the presence of neck pain and stiffness on physical exam in ED patients with an acute headache is strongly associated with subarachnoid, do not use any single physical exam sign or symptom to rule out subarachnoid. In other words, use the Ottawa subarachnoid hemorrhage rule in, a in aggregate to exclude or rule out subarachnoid and don't use any specific sign or symptoms to achieve the same objective. And also, this clinical policy from 2019, ASEP addressed the six-hour CT utility to exclude subarachnoid with the following question. In the adult ED patient presenting with acute headache, does a normal non-contrast head CT scan performed within six hours of headache onset preclude the need for further diagnostic workup for subarachnoid? A level B recommendation was again generated. Use a normal non-contrast head CT, minimum third generation scanner to perform within six hours of symptom onset in an ED headache per patient with a normal exam to rule out non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. In other words, if a good scanner recent generation is performed head CT within six hours, no need for lumbar puncture following CT scanning that is negative. Now, what about the issue of CTA versus lumbar puncture? In the adult ED patient who is still considered to be at risk for subarachnoid after a negative non-contrast head CT, is CTA of the head as effective as LP to safely rule out subarachnoid? ASEP has done a great service to us because they answered the two questions that remained following the 2008 clinical policy, and given the new uh, advancements made in diagnostics, especially neuroimaging with non-contrast CT, and the availability of CT angiography. This question generated a level C recommendation, one that we should all consider, and it says, perform an LP or CTA to safely rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage in the adult ED patient who is still considered to be at risk for subarachnoid hemorrhage after a negative non-contrast head CT result. When considering the diagnosis and treatment of emergency department headache patients, especially in the setting of this current COVID-19 pandemic, the following can be concluded. Emergency department headache patients who present with potential life threats can be identified 
In order to do so, a systematic evaluation is critical, and the electronic medical record can help with this process. Most importantly, subarachnoid hemorrhage can be excluded in patients who present with sudden severe headache, given our current diagnostic capabilities. Also to be noted, head and neck infection, CNS infection, and CNS thrombosis must be considered if subarachnoid hemorrhage is excluded as the likely etiology for patients with potentially life-threatening headaches in the emergency department. During the time of this current COVID-19 pandemic, it is possible that common primary etiologies of headache, such as muscle tension headache, migraine, or even headache related to dehydration, can commonly be seen in emergency department patients. However, when considering patients with potentially life-threatening headache in the emergency department, at this time, it is worthwhile to always consider COVID-19 as a potential etiology of these life-threatening headaches. During the time of this COVID-19 pandemic, besides specifically testing for the COVID-19 virus, there's no need to specifically alter our approach to diagnosing and treating patients in the emergency department with life-threatening headaches. If you have any specific questions related to this educational content, please send an email to fern.org at gmail.com. We encourage you also to go to the fern.org website for more content related to this educational program, as well as other content related to the care of patients who present to the emergency department with life-threatening illness and injury related to neurological emergencies. Thank you.